Facebook, hi and welcome. If you would like to get a recording of this particular webinar, please uh, click the link and register up and we'll get this out to you at the end of the webinar. Also, um, if you hang out to the end of the webinar, I do have a couple of special offers for you. Um, special things that we're gonna come, I'm gonna, I'll be sending right to you. Uh, one is the 15 benefits of intuitive eating. And another uh, special is going to be um, calorie counting debunked from Precision Nutrition, which is uh, a great um, resource to kind of take a look at and, and learn a little bit more about what we're gonna talk about here tonight. So um, I, I think I'm just going to get started and get rolling here. Uh, again, thank you so much for, for coming in. And um, free bonuses at the end. So you'll be, if you pop in, you're going to get the free bonuses. So that's the calorie counting debunked and also uh, intuitive eating benefits, 15 intuitive eating benefits, um, proven benefits. So you'll get an idea of, of where we're headed here as we move through today. So um, before we get started, what I would like you to do is, is pause and kind of take a deep breath and just be here. Um, and I'm gonna ask you to do something. I'm gonna change the slide in just a minute. I'm gonna ask you to do something. And when I do, all I want you to do is think about what comes up for you. Um, are there thoughts? Are there um, words in your head? Is there a feeling, you know, like in your, in your gut or in your shoulders? So what comes up? Does anything come up? Nothing might come up, but this just kind of, we're going to, I want you to just look at the picture. I'm going to ask you to do something and then pause for a minute and just notice what comes up for you. Okay. So we're going to get rolling. If you're just coming in, thank you so much for being here. I appreciate it. Um, there's a Q and A below. So feel free to ask questions anytime during the webinar. And I will be um, also offering, I have a special offer for you at the end and I want to make sure that that's up front. So here we go. Let's get started. What I would like to do is ask you to take a deep breath. And what I want you to do is I want you to go and weigh yourself. Now, what does that mean, right? I'm just saying, hey, what happens when you go to the doctor or what happens when you step on a scale or what happens when you go into a room that has a scale and you haven't stepped on a scale for a long time? What comes up for you? Are there any feelings? Are there any thoughts? Are there any um, uh, uh, anx an anxious feelings that come up? Is there a no way you're not gonna get me to step on that? So I want you to think about what happens when you have to weigh yourself. And just notice, is there anything that's happening in your body? Are there feelings going on in your body as you do this? What's, what's happening? What's going on? Um, does your stomach hurt? Are you anxious? Do you not care? That could be too. But I wanna ask this question because the scale can create a lot of anxiety for a lot of people. I know it has for me. So as we move through this webinar, Death to the Diets, I'm gonna share a reason that I'm hoping that by the end of this webinar, you're ready to take that scale, throw it out a window, drive over it, take a sledgehammer to it or something, because the weight on the scale is really not a clear measure of your health. So let's keep moving, okay? So you are in the right place. You are in the right place if you are tired of riding uh, this, this dieting hamster wheel, right? If you've been on and off diets, or if you're a chronic dieter, if you're a yo-yo dieter. I know for me in the past, there was three spaces I was in. I was in um, space one, on a diet. Space two, off a diet. Space three, well, looking for the next diet. So for many, many years, and I'll tell you a little bit more about my history, but if you're tired of riding this merry-go-round, if you're done, if you're um, sick and tired of always looking for something new, feeling like you're a failure because you can't keep the weight off, I'm going to share why that is as we move through. If you are, if you are, if you spend so much time in your brain thinking about what you're going to eat, where you're going to eat, do I have to exercise? Am I going to have to move today? Um, what did I eat yesterday? How many calories are in this? If that's where your brain is, you are in the right place today. You are also in the right place if you don't do things, you don't go places, you don't go to the beach, you don't put on a bathing suit, you don't um, go to that classroom, you don't um, apply for that job, 
due to the way you feel in your body. If you're worried about binging, overeating, emotional eating, if you're overwhelmed and sick and tired of seeing diet after diet after diet coming up into your Facebook stream or um, in, in your, in your, um, on your TV, there's so much overwhelming information out there. What's right? What's wrong? If you're confused, you are in the right place. So let's pause for a moment and come back to this scale question. So for um, almost 40 years, I spent my life trying to hit a number on a scale because I knew that if I hit that number, then everything would be okay. Like I'd be happy then. Um, I could do whatever I wanted, then everything would be all right. And knowing full well that anytime I got anywhere near it, my, I was still with myself. And this is, is truth for a lot of people. Um, so this, I want to kind of decipher a little bit the scales because the scale, because when we step on a scale, we usually have two feelings. So let's talk about that for a second. What thoughts and feelings come up for you when you step on a scale? So there's a thought and um, I've got there are two little happy fa our faces here, right? So the thought is, oh, awesome. It's a, it's a good, it's a good number. This is the number I've been searching for, or things are working or whatnot. Thought one, thought two, ugh, I can't believe it. I've been doing everything right. Um, I can't believe that I've gained weight or I can't believe the weight, my weight hasn't budged, right? So there's two separate tra trains of thought. And I want you to pause and think about what happens if you step on a scale, just imagine you step on a scale and you have um, the happy face. You're like, oh, awesome. What behaviors are linked to that? So if you're thinking, oh, that's great, what kind of behaviors stem from that? Things like, um, oh, it's working, I've got to restrict more, or, oh, it's working, I might want to go out and celebrate, what can I eat, right? So there's a couple of different behaviors linked to this feeling of, ah, oh, I must be doing something right. Yay, I can reward myself. So there's this thought of awesome and then a behavior that's linked to it. That's great. Yay for me. Let's, let's go out and celebrate, right? What can I eat? Or the flip side. So there's eat. The flip side is, um, oh, I must be doing something right. Um, so I've got to restrict more or um, I've got to keep on going and keep this. I got to be perfect. I got to um, do everything that, that, that the diet says and stay right here and do this. So there's, there's kind of these two two behaviors, eat and then restrict, right? Now, if we go flipping over to the other side and we step on the scale and it's not what we're looking for, or we thought it was going to be something different, or it's we're frustrated or we're angry or we're sad or we're in tears, what behaviors stem from that? And if you pause and think what behaviors sometimes stem from that, is it, oh, I can't, I, I, it doesn't matter anyway. It doesn't matter what I do. I'll never lose weight might as well eat whatever I want, right? Um, Kathy, I see that you just raised your hand. So I'm gonna come, I'm gonna come down and get your question in just one second. Um, or is it, well, then I can, I can eat, you know, like um, I, can, I might as well just eat. Or is it tomorrow I'm starting? Um, last supper eating tonight, tomorrow I'm starting. Tomorrow's gonna be the day I'm gonna start my diet tomorrow, right? So the different behaviors. So I'm gonna come in and pop up. Um, oh. Where's your hand, Kathy? I can't see it. So underneath, Kathy, look for a um, a Q and A. So um, and ask a question in a Q and in the Q and A. So um, versus a raised hand. I don't think I have a raised hand here. So I do have a Q and A though. So if you have questions, drop into a Q and A, the Q and A portion, um, and ask a question there. Just type in a question and I'll answer it. So. So coming back, so Kathy, go ahead and do that. So coming back to that, you have these two thoughts that stem from stepping on a scale, and then you have these two behaviors that stem from that. The behaviors though, as you notice, are exactly the same. Eat or don't eat. So just pause and think about that for a second. So it really doesn't matter the number on the scale, the behavior that's attached to it 
are one of two things, eat or don't eat. So let's dive in a little deeper with this, okay? I'm gonna share a little bit about my own story. And before I do, let me ask, it was an error. Okay. <laughs> Thanks, Kathy. Um, but feel free to answer, um, to ask questions as we go along. All right, here we go. Um, oh, okay. So a little bit about me. So here I am at like three years old, right? The tree that you see is basically the story of my life. Um, I had anorexia at 10 years old. So my disordered relationship, um, troubled relationship with food started then. I sometimes think about the last time that uh, food didn't have um, a connotation of calories or carbs or fat or um, restricting or anything like that. It, it, I, it's really hard for me to remember that um, until just the last few years. But this is, this is where I lived from age 10 to age 48, to be pretty pretty close to exact, on and off diets, um, exercise programs. I've tried everything: bulimia, exercise compulsion, anorexia, binge eating, body dysmorphia, right? All of it, and it stems from this feeling of not feeling good enough never thin enough, never fit enough, never, never strong enough, never um, weighing the number that I wanted. And I could have, I could very well still be here. It was when my body began to break down and I couldn't physically do the things that I wanted to be able to do that I had to push the pause button. I had to say, there's got to be a way out of this. I do not want to continue my life in this diet cycle. I just was tired. I just didn't want to do it anymore. It was too much work. There was too much money spent. There was too much time. There was too much energy. I think about how much um, time I wasted in my life worried about food and calories and, and the, the next diet and how many calories did I burn and how much I have to work out the next day. It was all um, uh, like, I think about a ball of wires, right? It was all like short circuiting in my brain and it was, it was just enough. So I ended up having um, to get my knee replaced at 50. And when that happened, I had some recovery time and I really said, there's got to be another way. And that's when I dove in and I did some research, right? I had to kind of sit back and say, what, what can I do? How can I help myself? How can I get out of where I am? And this is where I went back to school um, for, to become an eating disorder specialist. Um, I became an intuitive eating coach and I worked with body image. I worked with self-care, I worked with stress. Um, and, and then I shifted my thought process around exercise which I had lived my whole life revolved around. And it's, it's, and as you'll see, it's more shifted into play and joy and having fun, right? So a little bit about kind of my journey through, I chose not to stay put in that ham, on that hamster wheel, continuing to diet. And I can see very easily how I could still be there today. So let's talk about some facts. Did you know that 95% of diets fail? So, you know, you think about going into the doctor for a sore throat and um, they prescribe you an antibiotic that works 5% of the time. Oh, here, try this one. It might work 5% of the time. It doesn't happen, right? They prescribe antibiotics that work. So why do we go into a doctor's office? And if we're in a larger body or we're off the scale right? You know, the growth, I remember the growth charts when I was a kid, right? Or um, our BMI is off. That's a whole other webinar, but I'll get to that at some point, this BM, BMI webinar. Um, but why would any doctor prescribe something that fails 95% of the time? So 95% of the time, between one and five years, weight is gained back from any diet, and also 66% of that time, so two thirds of it, weight, more weight is gained back. And there's this illusion that, oh, I'll never get any bigger, but that's actually 
what the stats say is that we actually will gain more weight a lot of times after, after dieting. 91% of women are unhappy with their bodies. So if you think about how many women you interact with during your day, almost all of them are unhappy with their bodies at some point in time during the day. 81% of 10 year olds, this is fifth grade, right? Fourth, fifth, sixth grade, 10 year olds are afraid of being fat. Kindergartners are coming home from school worried about their weight. It's crazy. And somehow we've got to stop this, this cycle of dieting. And when it comes to the kids, I read a study um, just the other day that 85% of the kids that are really worried about their weight early, um, their parents have um, dieting behavior. So somehow what we have to begin to model um, something different for our children as well, or else these stats are going to go up, not down. 50% of women are on a diet today. So how of the other 50%, how many are looking for their next diet and how many are off the diet at the moment? Interesting thought to think about. And then the diet industry, $60 billion a year. So $60 billion a year in the diet industry. Diet industry telling you you're not good enough as you are. So I get all fired up about all of this. We're gonna talk about what happens. I get a question. So let me pop down here real quick. I lost the sound. Do you have the sound now, Kathy? Click in and say yay or nay. There should be a, did anybody, is, is anybody else hearing me? If you can pop in and say you're hearing me, that'd be great under the Q&A. But I kind of move that aside real quick. Um, I'm gonna keep rolling, but let me know, Kathy, if you can hear me. Um, there's usually a little microphone that you can click into to turn it on, or sometimes you might have to refresh. So what happens to our body during restriction? So let's talk about that. What do I mean by the restriction too? So let's clarify what restriction is. It's the body, it's the body not being able to get enough what it needs for, for fuel. If there are, um, if you have rules around food, like uh, you can't eat after six o'clock at night, or um, you can only eat so many, um, carbohydrates during the day, or if there's any foods that you have actually removed from your diet because they're not good, um, that is restriction. That is a diet. So if you have um, rules around food, that means that you're, um, you're on some sort of a restricted eating plan, right? Um, and nowadays they're calling them lifestyle plans, right? So it's a lifestyle plan. Is it a lifestyle plan that you can live on the rest of your life? That is the key question. If it's a lifestyle plan that you can um, live on the rest of your life and it has taken foods out, then that's gonna be something just to be aware of as you move, as you move through, your, through your days and your years because if some event happens, it's usually an external trigger, something outside of us. If something happens outside that um, pulls up our inner stress, that's that we start to that we shift over into eating food to help calm ourselves. Then all of a sudden, it's not you know you've restricted a certain type of of food. So I use this analogy a lot of times with with dieting. Um, if I were to have all, all foods in my, in the palm of my hand and I were to, I have to, re, I'm removing one particular food or food group, um, in order to lose weight, that's a diet. And in the same sentence, if I remove, um, a particular food or a food group, because it doesn't make me feel good, that's a choice. So there's a distinguish that I want to distinguish between the two things, food rules, diet, removal of a food group, and with the objective of losing weight, diet and restriction, okay? So just to kind of clarify that. So these are the things physiologically, internally, you have no control over them that happen during restriction. Number one, increase in cortisol levels. This is due to internal physiological stress. So um, our ancestors, right, uh, would go through periods of time where they would have famine, like this feast or famine. So they would eat and then they would go for a long period of time without food. The body developed a system to protect itself so that the 
the metabolism would drop and the body would hold on to fat so that you could live through the famine. And our bodies still respond that way to restriction. There's a higher level of cortisol. It's internal stress, right? Because the body is not getting what it needs. It's out of homeostasis. It needs fuel to survive. It doesn't, it's not getting what it needs. So it increases this cortisol level, which holds onto body fat and also is linked to decrease in, in um, metabolic rate, which you'll see down at the bottom as well. So we have an increase in cortisol level. We have a hunger hormone called ghrelin and our ghrelin increases. So um, the image I use is a toddler, you know, pulling on mom's shirt saying, mommy, mommy, I'm hungry, right? That's the, her ghrelin is kicking in and she's saying, I'm hungry. It's a physiological response to hunger. When we're restricting, that goes up. It's actually just telling your body, hey, it's, um, I'm hungry, um, knock, 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 you know, knock, 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 I'm hungry, come on, feed me. So um, it's giving you a response that says I'm hungry. At the same time, we have a, um, our fullness hormone, which is called leptin, and it decreases. So when we eat, we're not feeling full because our leptin um, is not being released to tell us, you know, we've had enough food. So these two things are working in conjunction along with this cortisol. So there's a lot of things going on within the body that's kind of giving you um, mixed, mix, it's fighting against you. It's fighting against your body to, to stay in this restriction or to lose weight even, right? Um, there's a great, there was a great study a couple of years ago, um, the biggest loser, they were testing, they tested all the people before they went on the ranch, they tested their leptin level and their leptin levels were all, were all normal. They were at the ranch for three months, all the restriction, all the um, over-exercising. At the end of their stay at the ranch, their leptin levels were almost non-existent. So they were always in a state of hunger. And that, so that's when they went home, no wonder when they started to eat again, they weren't able to really satisfy themselves because their leptin wasn't kicking in, right? And um, they started to gain weight. When they started to gain weight, they would start to restrict again and their leptin would drop again. So post, they said they did a test three years post this, this group of um, people that had gained weight after The Biggest Loser and their leptin levels were not even 50%. They're about halfway to, to where they were when they first started. So they're still finding themselves hungry, even if after they've gained the weight, because they continue to go into restriction, which continues to drop the leptin levels. And these things happen. Our body is so smart, right? It remembers, it starts to, it's, these things start to happen faster because it's like, oh, here she goes again, or here he goes again with the diet, it knows what's coming. So the ghrelin increases, the leptin drops out, the metabolism drops out, the cortisol kicks up, it's almost like an automatic. So with the longer the dieting history, the more these things come into effect. And then lastly, I wanna talk about this, um, our, our own inner autonomy, the, the brain's obsession um, about food. Uh, I use, it's not only just about, about um, when you're on a diet, it's about other things too. If something is pulled from you or said, somebody says to you, you cannot ever use that again. You can never take that again. You can never see that person again. What's the first thing that we do? I think about hands on the hips, you know, don't tell me what to do. I'm going to do what I want. So um, when I think about this, one of my favorite quotes from uh, Elise Reich, um, she's, a, she's a mentor of mine from Intuitive Eating. She, she had a quote, which I love to utilize with my clients as well. It is our inner drive for autonomy. So this don't tell me what to do. Our inner drive for autonomy will override our desire to lose weight. So if you're on a restricted plan at some point, your inner, your inner um, autonomous little girl, I think it is, or little boy pops out and says, don't tell me what to eat. I'm going to eat what I want. So you can't tell me what to eat. Right. So these are all things that are happening all at once. And the, meta the um, metabolic drop is something that I want to share a little bit more about with the key study. 
so if you've um, heard me talk at all, you know a little bit about this. Um, so let me pull you into, whoops, there we go. So here's the key study. Um, this is, uh, this was done in 1944, 1945. So the thing that really pisses me off, I think I can say that, right? Is that if, if we knew that this is what happened with the restriction in 1944 and 1945, why is it still socially so acceptable to be um, continuing to be on diets? And it is, it is culturally accepted to be on a diet. It's almost, it's almost like you're, you're um, like out of the loop if you're not on a particular eating plan. So in 1944, 1945, they took a group of men 25 or 20 to um, 30, you know, so young men, they put them through extensive physiological testing. So to make sure that their bodies were strong and that they were healthy and also emotional to see, to see that they were emotionally stable and they put them on a restricted plan, cut their calories in half for six months. This was an extremely difficult study for the men involved. And a lot of them, there was four that dropped out um, but it was a really difficult study for these men. These are the things that they found. This was, this is researched that it's called, um, the great starvation experiment, I think. So you can get the book. It's all, it's, it's a, a full written study. Met metabolic rate decreased 40%. Increased depression and emotional distress. This was in people in men that had no emotional, um, signs of distress at all, um, or depression or anxiety or anything increased food cravings. So they're, they're craving food, binging and purging, um, increased sensitivity to cold, to cold, social withdrawal and isolation. If you think about yourself on your last diet, how, what was the, what were the emotional things that happened? I know for me, whenever I was on a diet, I would always be withdrawing and isolating and moody, right? Depressed, all of that kind of linked in decline in concentration, lack of focus, always thinking about food. These men were bringing recipes to when they were eating. They were talking about food all the time. They were playing with their food um, and reduce sexual interest. And then post, they did a refeeding kind of some research on their refeeding, but there were eating disorders that came from this. And for, for most of the men, it took more than two years to regulate their eating their eating patterns were disruptive. They were disordered eat eaters post study. And so to me, this is, this is an important, you could never do this particular study now today, but they have this research. And then we have, the, we have lots of research saying that diets don't work because of these exact things. So it gets me really fired up and frustrated. And that's why we have to say, you know, put the end to the diet and get rid of the diets and get rid of um, diet culture and really take a look at what what's happening in our in our society in our culture when it comes to dieting and restricted food plans and lifestyle plans that are out there today. Here's another thing I want to talk about real quick, and this is the, um, the restriction and binge cycle. And so I know that there are probably people here that, that understand this, you know, from this restriction and dieting, um, be, we get this deprivation, we get this hunger, um, we get isolation and depression, anxiety, cravings. And then where you see this lightning bolt, this is, this is something usually happens, right? So what is it? It could be a comment from somebody. It could be a fight with a spouse or a family member or um, uh, like a failure of a, of a test or a bad grade on a test. Um, something that happened at work, uh, a step on the scale, um, a doctor's visit, um, a picture, you know, you see a picture of yourself walking by um, a mirror, right? Or trying on clothes, any of those things. And it just snaps. And that's where we look for a medicator. How can we make this feeling go away? And that's when the binge or the eating happens or we go off the diet. And then there's this <sighs> hatred, shame, guilt. 
which in and of itself is going to increase our stress level, increase anxiety, increase depression, right? And then there's usually another external trigger, or it could be this pursuit of the, of the thin ideal, or it could be that, that so-and-so um, is on a diet and it's working, so I might as well try that. Or it could be um, there's, a, there's a contest at work. Oh, so that that I'll jump in on that because that will be the answer. It's that holding of the golden ticket, that hope. Oh, that one worked for me um, 10 years ago. Maybe it'll work for me now. You know, so it's that searching for something that's going to work. And the next thing you know, you're you're back in the cycle. So this cycle just spins around and around and around. And so let's just pause for a second. Why is this so hard? Why is it that when we know that it doesn't work and that it, it um, takes up all of our time, it's so frustrating, we, uh, there's a low self-esteem, depression, anxiety, isolation, all of that's pulled in here, right? And um, there's guilt, we blame ourselves, we're, we're, our self-talk is horrible. Why is it so hard? And it's easy to see, it's everywhere. It's everywhere we look all of the different diet plans, keto, paleo, gluten-free. It doesn't matter if you look from the 70s through today. 70s in, in the 1970s, diets just started to make their increase. So you can actually see more and more diets kind of coming on the bandwagon as from the 70s up. And if you, if you look at um, weights in that same time frame, you know, weights have gone up in, in conjunction with dieting. So that tells us something too there, right? But it's everywhere you look, you can't go anywhere without hearing about the next thing. It's, um, it's at the newsstand, you know, it's on TV, it's on your social feeds. It's, you can't even go into a, um, I was in Panera the other day and I was sitting doing some work and there was, there were people talking about the diet plans, you know, that they were on right, right next to me. And it, it, it's, it's everywhere you go. And how can, how can we start to change the conversation? How can we get, um, get off of this dieting bandwagon and really put an end to dieting? Because there is another way. There's a better way to work with all of this. And that's what we're going to talk about now. And as I said at the beginning, um, at the end of this, I will give you the, the 15 benefits of intuitive eating and why it, does, why it does work. It's starting to tune into you and your body. We were born um, being able to tell when we were hungry, being able to tell when we were full, kind of being able to tell when we were thirsty, when we wanted to move, when we needed to cry, when we needed to sleep. Right. So this is we're going to we're going to kind of jump into this intuitive eating. And what does intuitive eating um, look like? And so let's talk about these are just a few of um, the keys to intuitive eating. But let's talk a little bit about them. So the first the, the biggest one here, the biggest foundation of intuitive eating is trusting your own internal hunger and fullness. So when you were a baby, you would cry and you would get fed and then you would stop, you know, your mouth would, you'd pull away from the bottle or the breast because, you know, you're full, you were done. And what happens is our hunger gets tested early. If you were put on a schedule and your mother didn't quite feed you or, you know, every, when you got hungry, maybe you were hungry at two and a half hours and the feeding time was four hours, right? So there's a disconnection of hunger at that point in time with, um, with toddlers, if it's five o'clock and they're asking mom, you know, mom, I'm hungry. I want a snack. And um, mom or dad will say, well, don't, you know, you, we don't want you to spoil your dinner. So they kind of hold on. So there's another disconnection of hunger. And then the toddler sits down to dinner and then eats half dinner, half the dinner. I'm full. But usually mom or dad will say, finish your plate. So there's a disconnection of fullness as well. There's the use of food for punishment. There's the use of food or, or the restriction or withholding of food for punishment. Um, there's the use of food for um, reward or for um, keeping a child quiet 
right? So there, our, our hunger and fullness are disconnected from an early age. So it's kind of, it's this, no wonder we don't really understand our own hunger and fullness, right? So trusting, beginning to, to learn how to trust our own bodies. What does it feel like to be hungry for you? What does it feel like to be comfortably full for you? What do those things feel like? And for, a, for I know for me, it was really, really difficult. It took me a long time. It took me over a year to really try to figure out what my hunger cues were, what my fullness cues were, and what worked for me, right? So um, this isn't a quick fix, but that trusting of your body is really important. And if you have extensive diet history, which means have been on numerous diets, your body has to begin to trust you as well. So it's not only you trusting your body and in, in what it, in the signals it's telling you, but it also the body needs to begin to trust you. Like, is she, is she gonna really keep feeding us? Because it's not quite so sure because it hasn't happened, right? So there's, there's this letting the body begin to trust you as well. So that's number one. Um, the second point that I want to talk about is this understanding the importance of satisfaction. The best description I can use with this is um, think about going into a restaurant and you sit down and you look at the menu and that you the the thing that you want first off pops right out. And nowadays they even have calories on on menus, right? So. Oh, that looks really good. That's what I really like, right? Satisfying. That's what I want. And then the brain kicks in and says, well, oh, you really shouldn't have that. That's really not good for you. Or that's too many calories or that's too fattening or any of the things that the, the, the mind says from, from, from its experiences. And so you choose something else. I should have this. This is what I should have. So you eat whatever it is that you should have. They come in and offer dessert and you say, oh no, I don't want any dessert. I'm being good, right? So there's no, so, so you de deny dessert. And then usually if there's disordered eating patterns or if, you're, if, you're, if you have this kind of um, behavior in the past, what happens is um, you make it home but you're not satisfied with the meal. And so that's where you eat eating happens in secret or eat, eating happens when you get home to satisfy the fact that you weren't satisfied at the meal. It's the best kind of analogy. So the satisfaction of food is really an important piece. What is satisfying to me? What makes me feel satisfied versus what should I eat? As a, and, and what do I want to eat versus what I should eat, right? And, and satisfying our own hunger. Coping with your emotions. Um, emotions are, uh, when we eat, this is a big reason for a lot of people, um, to eat when they're not hungry, right? Um, lonely, um, stressed, uh, scared, fearful, worried, right? Um, bored, anxious. So all of the different emotions that, that send us to food and, thinking about food when it comes to emotions, food actually elicits our parasympathetic nervous system. Our parasympathetic nervous system is our, is our relaxation system, right? So if we're stressed out and we eat, it makes us feel calm for a little while. It puts us in this rest and digest and calms us down. So yes, it works. But when we're eating, when we're not hungry, that means we're, um, eating when the body doesn't need to eat, right? It doesn't need any more fuel. So how can we cope with our emotions without the use of food? Or maybe um, partnering it, partnering some food with some other type of behavior that can elicit that parasympathetic nervous system as well. So this is where we'll come into, um, I'll discuss a little bit about the importance of decreasing stress and self-care. So. Um, being able to bring, to comfort yourself, right? Without the use of food. Um, a good friend of mine used to say, you know, like as opposed to coming home directly stressed out about um, uh, something that happened at work, 
and you go directly to the, the freezer and before you know it, the ice, you know, you're hitting the bottom of the carton of ice cream, right? And instead of that, knowing that you're going, you're, you're medicating, right? Or numbing with food to pull you into that parasympathetic nervous system and light up your brain a little bit. It's what do you need? So what do you need? Do you need to call a friend and vent? Do you need to take a shower, right? Do you need to take a walk? And then when you come home, you know, like the ice cream can be part of it. Maybe just a sit down and enjoy a cup of ice cream with, um, because you've already taken care of some of your other needs and then it becomes more satisfying. So this really understanding how to cope with emotions without food. And then the other piece that I put in here for, for tonight is this honoring your here and now body. Like this is the body that you're in right now. And if you hate it, and if we're, if we're having hateful moments when we don't like something, there's a tendency not to treat it very well. So pausing for a minute and just starting to say, hey, what, this, this is my body right now, right here. And, and let me just start to begin to treat it with some respect and honor, its, honor it when it's hungry and feed it because it needs fuel. Our brain needs fuel to keep moving our heart our lungs, our muscles, everything, you know, and, and our, and trusting. So it goes to this trust and respect. And this is the body, this is the body that you're in right now. Right. And to begin to um, just look at it as this, this wonderful, um, uh, what's the word vehicle, right? This vehicle that we're living this life in because we're so much more than just our body. So it's beginning to honor this here and now body, right? So that kind of gives you an idea of, of how we move away from this dieting realm that we know that doesn't work, um, that leaves us uh, stressed, um, anxious, uh, that um, takes up all of our time, our energy, right? Um, our money sometimes, and start to just go back to the basics start to trust our own bodies. And what does that look like? And this is a process. This takes some time to learn this whole intuitive eating piece, um, right? So it's, it, it does take some time. Um, and so what I wanna say is that it's not just about um, food either, but this intuitive eating piece, when I talk to people about this, it's, it's saying, I'm tired of the other way. Diets don't work for me. I can't do that anymore. I don't want to do that anymore. And jumping into intuitive eating with both feet. Um, I was talking to a woman the other day and a lot of people will, will say when they, they'll, they'll hear about intuitive eating and they'll go, well, let me try it. Let me try it for a, a month or two and see what happens. And what happens there is that, um, you're not really buying into it. So there's always in the back of your mind, there's always like this, um, this other way out. Uh, so if we were to put all diets on a, on a big raft and just sent them out on a river, right? Like that's what I did. I cut the string, I sent them out on the river. I'm never doing it again, period, done. I'm done, I jumped in with both feet, I'm done. I don't wanna be there anymore. And the choice is yours to do that, right? Um, but, what happens is that some people let me try it, which I think about they're holding onto a string that's tied to the diet. So they've let the diets go kind of, but they're still holding on to the string. Cause if this doesn't work, you know, then I, then I'll go back to something, something else. But how has that worked for you? So thinking about that piece. And when I talk about we talk about, um, I love this quote, the definition of insanity, right? Doing the same thing over and over and over again, expecting different results. If, if you have gone on diet after diet after diet after diet, and you, you're, you're at the same weight or you're at a higher weight or, you know, and it's, it may have worked and then not worked and worked and then not work and worked. And then, then the, the fact of the matter is now the body doesn't trust you anymore because of the dieting history. And it's, we've got to regain that trust and jump in with both feet and trying something different. So it doesn't have to be this way. And I want to share with you a little bit about my own approach. And this is 
from my own research. And this is what I've found to work because it's, it's a um, comprehensive approach. This intuitive eating is part of it, rejecting the diet mentality and jumping into trusting the body. And there's more to it, right? We talked about cortisol and stress. So figuring out a way to engage in daily self-care is another part of this. You know, self-care is essential. It's not a luxury. Right now on the, on the Shaping Perspectives Facebook page, we're doing um, a week, a self-care week. And so all week we're talking about self-care and how can you implement daily self-care and why it's so important. So this is kind of our five-step formula. Are you are enough just as you are right here, right now, right today? Eat intuitive and, inten and intentionally. Move and play. Our bodies were designed to move. As kids, we love to move. Move and play with joy. Find things you like to do, you want to do, not something you should do or have to do. Mindset, shifting the mindset. We have a really great tool um, at Shaping Perspectives that we use with to help shift this mindset from the one that's beating you up, shame and guilt, um, worry, anxiety, to one that is positive more compassionate, curious, kind, non-judgmental. You hear, we're hearing about mindset all over the place now, creating new neural pathways in our brain around food, around eating, around our bodies, around ourselves, right? And accepting your here and now body. Um, I think about when we called the company Shaping Perspectives, it wasn't just because it was something we liked. It's about let's 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 shape the perspective how we see all of these things, how we see our bodies, what's our shape our perspective around eating and food, um, around self care, around our self talk. Look at it from another another angle because what's been going on and what's happening with my clients hasn't been working. So let's start to shift. So this is kind of where. Um, I want to talk about how you can begin to implement these, these five steps. So um, I'm going to go into a, something that we're offering. One of the, the, our signature program at Shaving Perspectives is what I call a VIP. Um, and the VIP, very important person, right, is an actual three-day all-in um, jump in. And women come usually here to Maine, to the coast of Maine. And we spend three days deep diving. Um, I have also gone to homes, other people's homes, and spent time there deep diving into all of these things, eating, moving, self-talk, mindset, body appreciation, self-care, all of it, right? Um, but it's not feasible for everybody. It's, you know, it's, it's time. It's a way. There, so people don't have the time. They can't get away. They might not have the financial um, means to do that. So what I'm offering is something that's really exciting. And it's a, um, I'm calling it a you are enough three hour, a three hour virtual breakthrough session. So this is um, from the comfort of your own home. We come together for three hours and we move through what's blocking you. You know, what's going on with you. I'm going to go right here for a second. Kind of, this is, this is kind of what we do. Um, we create our vision. We call it a destination postcard. If we, if we don't know where we're going or what we want to be able to do with our bodies in our life, we got to figure out what is it that you want to be able to do? You know, what's your why? And take a look at that so that we can start to move towards that. Look at the different blocks that are coming up for you. Um, challenges. What, how do you sabotage yourself? Right. And look at ways to get unstuck. And then I, then I just, because of my experience and um, we talk together and we, and we migrate through and find tools that work for you. And we map out an action plan for you. Um, what does it look like? How can, how can intuitive eating work for you and moving and, and what does it look like to, to take time for yourself? I can, I don't have time. Yes, you do. And we can figure out how we be very inventive. A lot of times we're very inventive, but it's really knowing that you are worth it and that you are enough. So I'm going to kind of share with you. This is a note from Eliza 
which I love. Um, best news, I don't appear to be obsessed about sweets all the time anymore. It's strange and fabulous. In the past, I spent all this time and energy, mostly emotional energy, planning, eating, and feeling bad about myself. So no wonder I have so much more energy, right? Um, and that's the stories that I hear, feeling good in my body of people that have not felt good in their body for years and years and years. And are their bodies perfect? No, but they are feeling so much better in their body and their brain space is so much more open, right? My head space is much more expansive, free and happy because I'm not spending time adding up calories or worrying about last night's dessert will show up on the scale, right? These are um, from women that I've been working with. It's just amazing to see transformation. This via this um, virtual session, we schedule and we move through all of these five steps because it's not just about the food and it's not just about exercise. That's what we've been told. Um, that's what's, that's what's, what's out there. That's what we keep getting um, pushed in our face. Try this exercise plan, um, lose 10 pounds in five days, um, this diet, right? So it's eating and moving are kind of the two things that are the are the standalones but there's so much more to that and that's why these other pieces are so important to me the body appreciation understanding the body the positive self-talk um, really shifting the mindset huge huge transitions can be made by mindset alone and then self-care so this is this is the um the program that I'm that I'm offering and I'm going to um, give you a special offer for it um, this is just another uh a testimonial from Marie, a VIP experience is a unique experience. Um, creating a safe space is something that I really find really important. Um, I have been there, I have seen it, I have done it, um, and nothing surprises me. And I find that that becomes a really useful tool to navigate where people are, where are you, let's, let's dive in together be there together, walk together, and figure out a way out of, out of this space that you're living. Because if you're done, it's time, and there's hope to jump out. So there's a, um, a little testimonial from Marie. So this three-hour breakthrough is, um, and for this one, um, this was the last one, I should have written this, but this is good for through tomorrow night. It's already set up. I'm going to drop it in the link. You'll get a link for it um, when you get the recording, but it's, it's regularly $4.97. I'm offering it for $3.47. It's three hours deep dive. Plus, um, you know, a week or two weeks after we schedule us another call and we say what's working, what's not working. Let's make sure that whatever we put together, you know, this plan that we put together is working for you. And so that's where, um, that's how this particular VIP um, breakthrough, this you are enough breakthrough works. Um, I'm really excited to be able to do it from people wherever they are. They don't have to, you know, come to Maine to do it. So um, this is this is the offer for today. Um, Abby, another one of my clients, uh, if you need help and support with eating, fitness, stress management, or body and image issues, contact her now. I love what I do. This is my mission. This is my passion to help women not be where I was. I think about, like I said at the beginning, coming right back to that, I think about where I was, how much time, how much money, how much energy I spent in this place of um, calorie hell, I guess, right? And to say, I had enough I chose not to stay there. I chose a different way. And so I hope that, you know, you might think about um, jumping in and doing a, doing a virtual session with me. If not, I hope that you learned something a little bit about diets tonight. Um, what I would really like to do is stop the share and open up for questions. So if anybody has any questions on um, what I talked about, um, some of the, the physiological around uh, physiological um, impacts of dieting, um, any of those types of things. Um, I'm more than happy to answer things at this point. 
Um, thank you so much for spending some time with me. I really, really appreciate you being here. Um, if um, I will be sending you out, if you registered, it, I will be sending you out a recording. So you'll get all the slides as well. Um, so you'll get the recording. You'll also get um, the 15 benefits, proven benefits to intuitive eating, and you'll get the calorie counting um, calorie counting calories debunked from precision nutrition report which is another great resource so um i hope you all have a good night i hope that you can kick your scale um, out of your home um, i hope you can let go of the raft of diets and jump in with both feet to a new happier um, healthier way of living your life through intuitive eating so um, Joanne, you have your hand raised. Can you write a Q&A, Joanne? Here, actually, let me open you up. I can't. I apologize. There's a Q&A button somewhere. If you um, type in a question, I will answer it. So if you're on Facebook, um, thank you so much for joining in um, and watching if you popped in or popped out. Uh, also, if you want the recording, please sign up. It will be open for another, say, 10 minutes. Um, we'll keep it open and then everybody will get the 15 proven benefits, the counting calories debunked. And I'll also be popping in um, my scheduler. So if you're ready to, to jump into a breakthrough and, and change, make a change, um, you can schedule that. Um, right right now if you'd like so um i don't see here okay so so um joanne i can't see your question thank you all so much i'm going to be signing out Thank you, thank you, thank you for being being here, taking some of your precious time. I so appreciate it. Um, and I hope to see you on the other end. Bye now.